Please welcome to the stage, Jezebel Express! Brownies. I remember brownies. They're, uh... They're square, and they're sweet, and, well, they're brown, I guess. And uh, they come in a box. It's not right. They come in a box. That can't be right. No, no, they do. They do. They come in a box, and then you mix it with wet stuff, and then you put it in the hot thing, the big hot thing, not the little one, the, not, the, not the microwave, the other one, the big one, the, uh, the oven. You put it in the oven, and then it gets hard, and you take it out, and that's when you make it into little squares, and then you eat them, and they're delicious. I'm gonna make some brownies. I am 30 years old. I'm standing in the middle of my kitchen on the Lower East Side, and I've just decided that I'm going to make brownies to celebrate my three-month anniversary of having survived a stroke. Now, I've just remembered what brownies are, and this is what my life is like now. It's as though the library of my memory has caved in on itself, and it's my job to pick through the rubble to find the facts that I need to get through my day. So I've just remembered brownies, and every day I remember new things. And there's one memory that I wish I could shake, but I can't. It lives in me between my heart and my throat, and that's the memory of what happened three months ago when everything changed. I'm standing in front of my bathroom sink, and I'm scrubbing my fingernails with a small bristled brush. And I don't feel good, it's early in the morning, and I haven't had enough sleep. And I look in the mirror, and I'm kind of shocked at how bad I look. I'm a weird shade of pale, and it's like my face is uneven, and I'm blurry. So I drop the brush, and I turn on the faucet so that I can splash water onto my face, or that's what I mean to do. But when I look down at my hands, they're stuck in that position, my right hand a claw over the left and the left still holding the brush. And it's like there's been a glitch in the matrix. So I think it again, drop the brush and nothing happens. And I try one more time insistently, drop the brush. And as I look down, it's like my understanding of the world expands and then contracts and explodes because I realize that I have lost control of my arms and I don't know how to be a human being if my body doesn't do what I tell it to. And I think that I might be stuck here, standing over my sink holding this brush for the rest of my life. So I think it one more time. Drop the brush. And nothing happens for a few seconds. And then my arm flails out spastically to the side and the brush clatters to the floor. And Everything starts getting snowy around the edges and I realize that I'm going to pass out. And I feel the cold tile underneath my feet and I think I've got to get somewhere softer. So I walk to my bed, or I try to walk to my bed, but the left side of my body is paralyzed. So I'm having a lot of trouble and I use the floor and the counter and my table and the wall. And eventually I get to the bed and I flop over the bed and I reach for my phone, but my hand slides off the glass. And I realized that I don't have the motor function I need to call 911. <laughs> Did I mention that I was naked? Yeah, I had just gotten out of the shower when all of this happened. So I was laying over my bed completely naked and I realized that I live alone and I'm single and nobody is coming and I can't call for help and I'm dying one of those New York deaths. The kind that seemed like it would be impossible to die in this day and age, right? With everyone so connected. But I am, because I feel that I'm dying. I can feel it shutting down. And I imagine a firefighter, and I imagine their faces when they burst through my door after the neighbors call and complain about the smell two weeks later, and they find my bloated, naked, rat-eaten body with my hand two inches from the phone. And I think, I think about that, and it, it seems so unfair, because that wasn't how I meant to go. But everything about this seems unfair because I didn't do any of the things that I wanted to do with my life. I didn't make good art, nothing that I was really proud of, and I didn't travel. I never saw anything because it was too uncomfortable for me to go someplace where I didn't speak the language. I never got married. 
I mean, I don't even want to get married. <laughs> but that's the kind of thing you think about when you're dying, and you do know that you're dying. It's very, very clear. You can feel it shutting down. Like you're in a giant theater, and the lights are shutting off from the back of the room, and soon you'll be sitting in the dark, but they're just going, boom, boom. And you know that soon you're gonna be in pitch black and there's nothing that you can do to stop it. And that realization makes me gasp. <gasps> and then I realize something. I realize that I'm still breathing. And if I'm breathing, I'm not dead. So if I don't wanna die, all I have to do is keep breathing. And I push all of the thoughts of rats and firefighters out of my head and that is what I concentrate all of my energy on single-minded, one focus. I breathe in, and then I breathe out. And then I do it again. I breathe in, and then I breathe out. And this goes on for some time. And about two hours later, I realize that I can move my hands. And then I realize that I can move my feet, and that I can stand up. So I go to my doctor. I should have called an ambulance, but I just acquired a brain injury and I wasn't thinking very clearly. So I, I go to my doctor, even though I don't really understand how taxi cabs work, I know that I have to get into the yellow car and they will take me somewhere, but I don't know why he's yelling at me and I don't know why he's taken my purse and taken the green things out of it and thrown the purse back at me and told me to get out of the car. But I grab my purse and I get out of the car and I go into the doctor's office and it is white and clean and organized and I think that she will tell me what is wrong. She will be able to fix this. And I stand in front of the doctor, and there are tears streaming down my face, and I'm listing slightly side to side, and I can't remember my middle name, but I can remember the name of the current president, and she tells me that I'm having a panic attack and gives me a clonopin, and she sends me home. So I go back to my house, and I take the clonopin, and I hope with everything in my being that when I wake up in a couple of hours, this will all seem like a bad dream. But I don't wake up in a couple of hours. I'm in and out of consciousness and pain and disorientation. And when I finally stumble from my bed consciously five days later, I go to the bathroom and on my way there I notice that there's a menu on my fridge written in Chinese. And I think that's weird. And even as I'm thinking it, I see English language letters appearing from it. There's an A and there's a C, and I realize that the menu isn't in Chinese, it's in English. I just can't read. So after that, there are a lot of doctors and a lot of needles and machines that zap me and machines that shudder from side to side. And after three months, we do know some things. We know that I've had a stroke in the prefrontal cortex of my brain, possibly a series of strokes, what they call a shower of embolism, which is a pretty fucking festive term for something that might kill you if you ask me. <laughs> we know that there's a big dead spot in my brain the size of a peanut M&M, but like a big peanut M&M, like one of those mutant ones that has two peanuts in it. <laughs> yeah, it's like that size. And we know that my ability to function in my day-to-day -day life has been severely diminished. I've lost most of the function in my left hand and my left foot. I don't understand important concepts like time. And my short-term memory is so bad that if you ask me a question, I'll be able to reply to it, but I might not remember what your question was by the time I'm done talking. All of that is troubling, but what's more troubling is the things that we don't know. We don't know what causes a stroke, and we don't know if I'm going to have another one. Three months seems like a long time without a diagnosis, but it actually takes us about 18 months to figure out that I have a blood clotting disorder that probably led to the stroke. And while we're three months out from the stroke, no one can tell me what caused it, and no one can tell me with any certainty whether or not I'll have another one. So at this point, I'm celebrating days and weeks and months because I'm not sure if I have years. And for this three month anniversary, I've decided to make these brownies, and God damn it, I'm gonna do it. Even though I'm not really supposed to be making brownies. After an incident a few months ago, when I reached out and grabbed a hot pan with my bare hand because I didn't understand that it would hurt me, my family and friends have decided that possibly I shouldn't cook until we've got the brain thing a little bit more under control. So I don't tell anyone that I'm making brownies. And it's partly because I don't want people to tell me that I can't, but I also don't want them to know if I fail. And I recognize that there is a chance that I will fail. 
So I start for the first and the 50th time to make brownies. And there is so much I love about making brownies. I love the puff of powder that rises when you upend the mix into a bowl. And I love the white plastic packet of factory caramel goo. And I love the two perfect eggs that I hold in my hand for just a second before cracking them. I love the sandy taste of the batter on my tongue, the badness of eating something raw. And I love what the brownies show me that I can do when I bend over with a paper towel to wipe up a drip of batter that's fallen on the floor. It is a miracle because a month ago I dropped a 500 bottle of Tylenol on the floor and I just sat down in the middle of the mess and cried because I knew that there was no way I could pick up all those pills. And I love that I'm learning how to work with this brain, that I know that my sense of time is pretty iffy, so I set three different timers and I put them all around my house to make sure that I don't accidentally cook the brownies for 25 hours instead of 25 minutes and burn the whole place down. And I take an oven mitt and I put it on top of my stove so that I'll remember that when I need to take the brownies out of the oven, I, I, I'll be able to do that. And I love that while the brownies are cooking, I can tell the difference between the sickly sweet egg smell of something raw and that dry cooked smell, that dry baked smell of something that's done. And even though I didn't know what brownies were this morning, I know that they're done while I'm in the other room. There's this back burner part of my brain that still has everything in there and it feels so good. And when I take the brownies out of the oven, I do not burn myself. And I look at them and they are exactly the size and the shape that they're meant to be and I let them cool, and I cut out a perfect square, and I bring it to my mouth, and I take a bite, and they are perfect. They are exactly what I meant to do. And there is so much I can't do three months after my stroke. I can't ride the subway, or read a map, or order a sandwich, because I don't know what a pickle is. <laughs> There is so much I can do, but I have done this one thing. And I look down at this beautiful brownie with a crescent shape from my teeth carved out of it, and I realize that for the first time since I had the stroke, I believe that maybe, someday, everything might be okay. And I think about those eggs the way that I hesitated before cracking them, but then I did, I broke them, and they became something new, part of something whole, something different, not better or worse, but something different. And they were still useful and important, and it was okay that they were broken, and there's a feeling for it, and I can feel it rising in me, and I don't know, I don't know what the feeling is that I have from making these brownies, and I can't remember the word, but I realized that today, I made something that was whole and perfect, even if I'm not, and suddenly, the word comes to me, and it's exactly the right word, and I know what it is, and I know that there are gonna be hard days ahead, but here today, I did just the thing that I meant to do, and I hold the word close to me, and I know that I've got this one back, and that I'm gonna carry it through the rest of the hard days. And the brownies are perfect, and the word is hope.